Awesome. Um, so thank you, Sharat. Um, I'm Michael Bidstedt. I run the JVM team at Oracle, and I'm going to talk about Java, uh, sorry, JDK Flight Recorder today uh, and some of the cool stuff we've done over the last few years in making continuous monitoring super simple and powerful. Uh, so first of all, uh, we have the standard Oracle Safe Harbor slide saying everything I'm about to say is a lie, so don't trust me. Um, but um, uh, more seriously, uh, let's say you have a product, you run your business and it's running a service somewhere. And obviously you want to make sure that this service keeps running because it's super important. That's, that's after all what, what makes up your business, right? So at some point you get a problem. This is probably at an inconvenient time. It's probably Saturday. It's probably even Saturday like at 3 a.m. in the morning or something. It's like you don't really want to be there, but now you have to go in and investigate what's going on. Some SLA has been broken or breached uh, and you need to understand why that happened. Now, one of the challenges is that in some cases you may not even have the data available uh, to you to do that investigation in a good way. So it's really hard to find the root cause, and, and, uh, root cause of this problem and figure out what actually went wrong. So you might be tempted to add some amount of logging to see if you can get additional data. So maybe you understand which rough area things are going wrong in, but you know you don't have the details. So you add some logging, you turn on that logging, and you keep running the service for a while. And unfortunately, chances are you're not actually going to capture more of that data. So this was a one-off intermittent problem. And what's worse is that that logging you added, it comes with some kind of overhead, be it in terms of performance or it makes the code more complex or in either case at some point you'll have to realize that it didn't work out so you disable the logging and guess what some Saturday 3 a.m. in the morning you're back to SLA being breached again and you don't have the data available so this is sort of a, a bad cycle right you you don't want to be there at 3 a.m. in the morning all the time and what the flight industry has already figured out is that uh, it's really good to capture a lot of fine-grained data uh, continuously in the background uh, so that you, when you actually need it, you have it available to you and you can do that detailed analysis, figuring out exactly what went uh, wrong or what led up to the problem without really caring about what, that it's there, that, it, that they, data is being collected on a daily basis. It's something that's happening in the background. Uh, and basically, that is what we've done with Flight Recorder in the Java runtime as well. And I'm going to talk about uh, in the next uh, 50 or so minutes uh, a bit about what that means on our level, what JFR is. Uh, so the agenda looks roughly like this. Um, what, what is JD, JDK Flight Recorder? Um, I'm going to talk a bit about JFR events uh, because events are very central to how uh, JDK Flight Recorder works in the background. Um, I will mention a few times throughout this presentation the fact that JFR is designed uh, to be used in production. Uh, and I want you, if anything, like if you remember anything from this presentation, please remember that it is meant for production. It's not just for development. Obviously, that's a use case as well, but it is meant for production. It's very mature technology. Uh, I am going to talk a bit about how you can use JFR, uh, show a few demos throughout the slide deck, uh, and I'm going to touch on a bit of future work, and it turns out that some of the future actually is here since of last week. So, uh, what is JDK Flight Recorder? Um, so, in a nutshell, uh, JDK Flight Recorder, uh, and I'm going to use the abbreviation JFR quite a lot, um, is uh, a monitoring um, framework. It's event-based. Uh, and again, I'm going to touch on the event-based uh, nature of it in the next few slides. Uh, it is available now and has been for quite some time. So it's probably in the JDK you're using. There are uh, exceptions to that, but a lot of the JDKs out there have flight recorder in one shape or form built into it already. So uh, chances are that if you try out a few of the demos that I'm going to show you later uh, for in, in the JDK you're using right now, chances are it may, may actually work. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's event-based. It's built into the Java runtime itself. Uh, and uh, I'll touch on uh, the details and sort of the um, do a deep dive to some extent into what that looks like inside the Java runtime. But the fact that it is built in means that it has extremely low overhead. Uh, it is designed, as a matter of fact, to have so low overhead that you can have it default on in production without really getting an overhead at all. You, you collect the data without the performance overhead. Uh, and uh, 
we have built it in such a way that uh, we collect data from multiple different layers or subsystems uh, of the software stack. So it's everything from the operating system all the way through the runtime, all the way up to the app. And what that allows you to do is to correlate uh, uh, events or things that happen uh, in a very powerful way. So I'll talk a bit about that later as well. Uh, and uh, we also have APIs both for producing your own events, but also for consuming and analyzing the events that have been generated. So uh, again, I'll, I'll show you a bit what that looks like, but this is sort of the overview. In a nutshell, here is what JFR is. So just to sort of get you uh, a feeling for what kind of data we collect, I'm going to try uh, a demo, uh, which will look like this. Uh, so what I've done here is, I'm hoping you can see this, uh, is the font like super small or something? Let me know. I can bump it up a bit. Um, so what I've done here is to, imp whoops, is to implement a small Java agent. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a Java agent is, it's sort of a, um, a small Java program that you can run in process next to your real application. So the, the real application I'm going to use here is J, uh, the Java 2D demo. But the Java agent, what, what happens when the JVM starts up is that it will fire up this, uh, this additional application next to, in the same process, running on the same Java heap and all of that, uh, uh, next to it. And the health report jar here is a JFR small monitoring agent. Uh, and basically what that will look like, again, I'll go more into the details here, but if I run, fire this up, you'll see that it starts producing uh, a sort of a text-based um, uh, display of the kind of data it's collecting in the background. So this is JFR data being collected and displayed. Uh, you don't need to care so much about what the Java 2D demo looks like, even though that's cool as well. Uh, but this is just for you to get a sort of feeling of the kind of data we collect. Uh, so as you can see here, there's uh, a bunch of GC-related data, garbage collection-related data. So which GC is being used, uh, the uh, garbage collection pauses, things like that. Uh, we're collecting memory information for the system and also the kind of CPU um, you have in the system, how much it's being used, allocation rate, uh, thread count, that sort, sort of the, the things you, you'd expect, I guess, from the Java runtime. Uh, and then at the bottom, you can also see that we have two different uh, displays here. The first one in sort of the middle of the, the presentation is the top allocation methods. So that's telling you where is data being, or instances being allocated. Uh, and the second one is hot methods. So where is execution time being spent here? So again, I'll go into much more detail around what all of this, how it, uh, how it is being collected and how it is being presented, but this is sort of just for you to get a feeling for the kind of data that JFR is collecting. So going back to the presentation, um, uh, some history, oops. So JFR has been around for a very, very long time. Uh, so as a matter of fact, uh, for me, the story starts back in the early 2000s or so. Uh, I was working on another JVM at the time called JRocket. Uh, and one of the challenges we had developing the JVM itself was that it was actually really hard to understand what is going on inside of the JVM. And obviously, one of our key tasks was to figure out what is going on and optimize and improve on that. So we started sort of gradually adding more stuff to collect data inside of the JVM to understand what was going on. And the other thing that happened at roughly the same time was that our support team uh, who were sitting next to us and we were meeting up at the same coffee machine, they were also pointing out how our code mostly worked, I wanna hope uh, and think, but, but from time to time there were issues and it sure would have been nice for them to have a better way of understanding what was going on. Uh, and especially tricky is the situation where you have some customer telling you that things aren't working the way they're supposed to. And getting the data from that customer, it always, or in many cases, it came down to sending log files with, again, not that great detail uh, inside of it. So some kind of better way to, uh, to collect and send, pass around all of that and analyze it uh, was needed. So we started working on it, it may probably 15 or 20 years ago or so now. Uh, in more recent history, uh, we moved uh, that whole functionality over to the hotspot JVM, which is the one that is in 
probably the JDK you're using right now. Um, it used to be a Oracle commercial closed feature. Um, the first release it was included in was 7U4 back in 2012. Uh, and over time, we've uh, done a couple of uh, things to it. So first in 2017 with JDK 9, uh, we uh, uh, provided APIs for creating and consuming data. So it used to be sort of internal only, uh, but uh, with JDK 9, there are now APIs. And probably the biggest and most important thing that happened to JFR is that in 2018 with JDK 11, it was open sourced. So now this whole functionality is in the JDK open sourced uh, and multiple other people and vendors in the, the world are working together on the implementation. So you don't need to remember all of this, but uh, one of the takeaways here is that the technology and concept as such has been, along for, has been uh, uh, around for a very, very long time. And that sort of comes back to the whole concept of uh, possible or uh, we encourage you even to use this in production. It's really stable. So uh, I did mention, or I've already mentioned a few times, the concept of events. Uh, and those are, again, very central to how Flight Recorder works. So I'm going to talk a bit more about what that looks like in more detail. So this is basically the uh, sort of autonomy of a JFR event. Uh, so uh, an event is a small blob of data. Um, it has a few different uh, fields in it. Uh, the first one is an event ID. So this is sort of the unique identifier for this event. Nothing uh, super special about that, uh, but it's very helpful if you want to understand uh, or find this event later, that sort of thing. Um, an event uh, has a timestamp. Uh, so when was this event, when did this event actually happen? Um, so it gets a timestamp it may have a duration. Uh, and the thing there is that many events do. So many events uh, span, there's like an operation and it starts and it ends. But there are some events that are instantaneous. They, they don't really have a duration. They happen instantaneously. Uh, and so the duration is optional, if you so will. Uh, an event has a thread ID associated with it, uh, or can have a thread ID associated with it, because much like the duration, not all thread, not all events are necessarily produced in or related to a thread, but many are, and therefore it's helpful to have the concept of a thread ID in there as well. There's also an optional stack trace associated with every uh, event. Uh, so in some cases, the stack trace may not be helpful, but in many cases it is, because it may, may not be um, it may be very interesting to see where the event is being produced, not just sort of the top frame, but also the, the whole stack trace. How did, did we get there? Uh, now, in order to keep the footprint of an event down, uh, this is actually handled uh, in a slightly interesting way. So we have the stack trace is to a large extent sort of on the side. The only part uh, of the stack trace that is part of the event itself is an ID. And then we sort of have a symbol table on the side a side table where we keep track of the stack trace um, uh, because obviously those stack traces tend to contain strings that are that can be deduplicated. Many of the strings are the exact same and things like that. So there's a lot of uh, sort of tricky logic in the background to keep the footprint of events down and I'll go into slightly more detail about that later as well. So those are the events that are sort of common for all uh, sorry, the fields that are common for all the events, uh, but there are also event-specific uh, fields or payload uh, that can come after this. Uh, and so that's a bit abstract. So let's look at what this uh, could look like from the Java level. Uh, and I'll, I'll also quickly mention here that there are sort of two sources of events here. They, all, they both feed into the same event stream in the end. But one source is from the Java level. So there's an API that we even use internally in the Java runtime to produce events and feed them into the stream. Uh, there's also a corresponding native API that is only accessible inside of the JVM itself. And I'll, I'll show you a, an overview picture of this a bit later, but uh, those are the two sort of sources. And so what I'm going to show you here is the Java level um, way of producing events. Uh, and this is probably the way that you'll, um, you'll be using yourself if you were to play around with this. So how do you produce your own uh, J4 event? Uh, so there is a, a package, a, a module, I should say, first uh, in the JDK uh, called JDK J4. And there's a package in there called JDK J4. And there's a class called event. Uh, and event is the base class uh, from which all events are derived. Uh, so if you want to produce your own event, this is it. 
This is exactly how you do that. So you now have uh, a my event uh, that is a GA4 event. So that's great. But let's see how you can use that because the only thing you've done now is obviously declare it. So let's say uh, that you have some really uh, interesting business logic. You, uh, you are, I don't know, calculating the next stock price or Fibonacci number, or whatever it is. Uh, so the do important stuff here is your business logic. Uh, and let's say that I want to produce an event that uh, uh, represents in some way the business logic I just executed. So the way you do that is uh, something like this. So you start by allocating an instance of the event you just created, the my event thing. Uh, you call begin. Oh, I, I remember now that I made this build. So you allocate it, you call begin. And what begin does is basically take the timestamp of the start of the event. Uh, so um, now we know when the event started. You then go execute your business logic. So you now have computed your Fibonacci number or whatever it is. Uh, and after that, you call end. And what end does is much like begin, it takes the timestamp. Uh, now it, we have the start and the end, and we can therefore uh, calculate the duration of the event. Uh, and once you have that, you call commit. And that's what actually takes this event data and feeds it into the JFR data stream in the background. So that's pretty much it. Now, one of the questions you might have is, why do I have to call end and then also call commit? Can't I do just one of them? And it does turn out that if you don't call end, commit will do the work for you. It will actually call or capture that end timestamp. So why, why are there two different uh, methods here? Well, there are cases where it turns out that it can be handy to, uh, uh, to have separate uh, methods for capturing the end timestamp versus committing all of that data into the stream. Uh, specifically, you can imagine a case where uh, you want to get the timestamp taken exactly at some point in time when you know that you have executed your business logic and it's now done, but then you want to do some kind of computation uh, and add data to the event before you commit it. And as a matter of fact, the way you do that, so the obvious next question here is how do I provide my own um, data to this event. So the way you do that is perhaps not surprisingly by adding fields to that class. So in this case, I've added two um, fields um, to event specific payload fields. Uh, the first one is called message, it's a string, and the second one is a value. Now, these are not very cleverly named. Uh, I'm sure you can come up with something better than that, but this is sort of just to illustrate how, uh, how I can provide my own data um, in that event. So as you can see on the right hand side, I'm initializing those fields uh, as immediately after I've allocated the event. And uh, these are obviously sort of constants in my case. Now those could be something else. Uh, so specifically, if you wanted to have the value be the result of the business logic uh, you executed, maybe it is the Fibonacci number you computed, you can do that as well. So you can, for example, uh, set the values somewhere after you've executed the, uh, the business logic. And more specifically, you can do it anywhere before you call commit. So if you, uh, if you can leave the uh, initialization of the values until the very end before you call commit, but you do need to set them before the call to commit. Um, so that's sort of flexible. Um, the, uh, the other thing that you may want to uh, keep in, in, take into account here is that the fields themselves are not very uh, interesting if you can't then later make sense of them in some way. Uh, and that same thing goes for the event. So we have obviously looked at the producing the event now, but in order to make it easier to consume the event and visualize it on the other side, there are a few helpful annotations that you can use to annotate the event and the fields inside of it. Uh, I've shown you a few here, uh, and I have a slide, uh, the next slide, as, as a matter of fact, will show you a few additional annotations, but uh, a few of the key, sort of key ones to keep in mind. Uh, the first one is name. Uh, the name is, uh, if you don't have the name annotation, you'll get the default name for the event. And that will be the full package name and class name uh, for the event itself. So uh, that may be a good thing. Uh, in some cases it may work, but in some cases, if you have your class, your type declared in, let's say, com internal, my secret uh, project, uh, dollar foobar, uh, it's not going to look very good when you present it in the other end. So uh, it's sort of recommended, strongly recommended to give an event a, a better name uh, if the package name and class name isn't good enough. 
the label annotation uh, is a very short description of what the event symbolizes. Uh, basically, it's like a couple of words or so. Uh, and for the fields, you can also have labels. Uh, I've clearly not done my best work naming them here, so they're just saying you know, message and value. So, uh, but basically, if you want to expand a bit on what the uh, fields symbolize, the semantics of them, then you can add that as label annotations as well. Um, there are additional annotations. This list is not exhaustive, um, so there, uh, there are additional um, annotations that you can and uh, should look into using. Uh, the Java docs for the JDK.JFR package uh, uh, is very good, so I encourage you to go look at that. I will highlight a few things here. So we talked about name and label. If you want to have a slightly longer description of what an event actually is, then uh, there's an, uh, a description annotation. You're not suppo supposed to pull, put a full like um, essay in there, but uh, as I mentioned, label is supposed to be a very short, like a few words worth of description. Description can be a, a slightly longer, it's still you know limited to a couple of sentences or so. This is if you think about it more like you know the tooltip once you hover over something in a UI or something like that. Um, there are a few other things that can be of interest. So uh, threshold here is very key to how uh, JFR works. And uh, again, I'll cover this in a few uh, slides as well. But uh, events can be filtered. Uh, and as a matter of fact, in many cases, it turns out that it's very useful to filter events because you, we can produce a lot of data. But it turns out that in many cases, the data you are actually interested in is the stuff that takes a while, where the duration is significant, for some definition of significant. So the threshold annotation here uh, gives the default or sets the default minimum duration for an event to be included in the recording. So if you don't set it, it will be included. The threshold is set to zero. Uh, but let's say you have uh, an HTTP request that you're, you're logging. The event is symbolizing how long it took to process that uh, request. It probably is the case that if, uh, if it's less than, I'm picking a random number, but let's say 100 milliseconds, everything is probably working well. It's not worth logging that event to the screen. It that won't give you additional information. But if the event takes longer than that, you may well be interested in logging it. So therefore, it can be useful to set the threshold. There are a couple of an other annotations uh, which may be interesting as well. The, there's one called enabled. Uh, by default, all events are enabled. But if uh, a certain event is not, it's, you don't want to have it included in the event stream by default, then you can set enabled to false. Uh, and I also talked about stack traces. So included uh, in every event, there can be a stack trace. By default, if you don't do anything else, it will be included. But if there are events where stack traces really don't make sense or you don't care about them really, uh, you can disable them. So again, this is not exhaustive. Uh, there are certainly more annotations. So have a look at the Java docs if you're interested in the other ones. Uh, so some exam examples of uh, events that are generated by the Java runtime. Uh, this likewise is not an exhaustive list, uh, but you did see in my first demo there a few examples of the stuff that we're capturing. Right now in the Java runtime latest version, um, where we have approximately 140 event types or so, uh, this is something we are constantly working on adding to uh, and expanding. So over the next uh, few releases, you should expect to see additional stuff be captured. Um, but on a high level, things that, uh, that we are already capturing include things like the environment you're running in. So what was the command line that VM started up with? Uh, which version is the JDK? Uh, the, which operating system are you running and the uh, uh, version number of that? CPU information, things like that. Uh, when it comes to Java execution, we're capturing things like I.O., uh, so file and network I.O. specifically. Uh, we do thread sampling, so from time to time we have a look at what the threads are running uh, and we capture some information about that as well. That can be used to give you an indication or idea of where execution is happening and maybe where you should be um, optimizing things, for example. Uh, and on the JVM level, we uh, capture a lot of the sort of obvious stuff that is happening inside of the JVM, so class loading, garbage collection uh, information, uh, JIT compiler stuff, things like that. So this is sort of the I'm going to call it the, the more or less obvious stuff. Uh, and again, we are constantly working on improving on and expanding on what's being collected. 
So behind the scenes, uh, how does this actually work? Uh, so I did mention that there are two sources or ways we are producing data. Uh, so starting from the left in this picture, the topmost cloud there is the Java level API. So that's what we saw uh, an example of. Um, so basically you, uh, you create your events and when you say commit, they're being uh, put into this stream of events in the background. And there's also uh, this, the lower bottom cloud here is uh, representing the events that come in from the VM side. Now, important to know here is that those events are first being produced into thread local buffers. And that is very powerful because what that means is that uh, even if we produce a lot of data, that data is being produced into something that is local to the thread, very cache efficient. There's no uh, cross talking between threads or sockets or anything like that. Uh, these are just stores into a buffer, you know, striding stores, and that means that it's very, very fast. So even if you're producing a lot of data, we can, uh, given that we're producing that into thread local buffers, it is, it is uh, very efficient and fast. So um, um, at some point, obviously, the thread local buffers, buffers become full and you need to do something about that. So, uh, when the, the uh, thread local buffers fill up, the data is moved into or copied into global buffers. Uh, so this is happening in sort of the background. The application typically will not see this or block waiting for it. Uh, and when those global buffers in turn fill up, uh, we put that data into what we call the JFR data repository. So you can think of this as sort of a chunk or blob of data on disk somewhere if it helps. Um, this is not the JFR recording file directly. So we, we first store this into the repository and later you can extract that data and uh, copy it into a JFR recording. And I'll show you a bit later what that looks like. Uh, so previously, and this was true until, well, last week, um, we basically did this only when the global buffers filled up. So that was the only time we dumped that data out into the repository. But with uh, the recent functionality that we added in JDK 14, uh, we now want to make sure that the data is observable. And again, I'll talk about this later as well, but what that basically means is that the repository, uh, we want to make the data there consistent and observable on in not, not necessarily real time, but very close to. So we try to um, dump the data into the repository on uh, a roughly like once per second. Uh, and there's an interesting trade-off here between making the data observable as quickly as possible. If you want to understand what's going in the, on in the system, you, you want to be able to read data from this repository. And uh, that means making sure that it's consistent and all of that. So if you want to observe it quickly, you obviously want to dump it as, as frequently as possible. But the trade-off is obviously that then you have to go through the relatively costly process of getting the data from the thread local buffers into the global buffers and then down to the repository. So we've said along right now that uh, it's sort of a reasonable trade-off to do that once per second. It can be tuned depending on your situation. So you don't absolutely need to know all about the details here, but that may help you give a, get a feeling for how JFR is implemented and uh, sort of the unfair advantages we have of being the Java runtime and how we can handle data in the background. So um, the other part about JFR that uh, is sort of central to how it works is flight recorder files. Uh, so we have a file format for storing uh, events in the end. This is sort of the file that you can uh, produce, that you can analyze, and you can email your colleague uh, if you want them to take a look at what's going on. Um, so the, the flight recorder format, just to get a sort of feeling for what it is, is a very compact binary format. Uh, we're extensively using something called Varint 128 LED encoding, uh, and this is basically just a fancy way of saying most constants in the end turn out to be mostly zero. Uh, and instead of storing full 64-bit values or whatever it is, uh, we can instead use a variable int encoding and save a lot of space. Uh, and that does mean that in the end, the file recording format is very compact. We are not yet compressing it. So there's no sort of Z-lib um, compression on top of this. It is something we're investigating and considering. Uh, but for now, we're not compressing it. But it is still compact. Um, so it's very uh, dense. Uh, 
Uh, the second thing to know about the flight recording uh, file is that it is self-describing. Now, obviously, there's a high-level file format that you need to know about, but uh, the nice part about the events themselves having their metadata inside of the file that they're self-describing is that if you go in and add your own event and you record the data that includes that event, then obviously it would be a hassle and it would be very cumbersome if you have to you know, if you email this file to your colleague, you also have to email him or her some kind of description of what the event you added looks like. So instead, what we do is that we include all the information about all the events, what they look like, which fields they have, the annotations I mentioned earlier, all of that is part of the file itself. So if you want to visualize this, uh, the visualization framework or tool uh, has all the information needed to do that in a good way. Um, Yes, I think that's what I'll say about the file format. I mentioned filtering. So uh, Flight Recorder can produce a lot of data. Uh, and in the end, it's helpful, obviously, to filter it in various ways uh, in order to keep the amount of data you record down. The obvious thing you can filter on is the event type or the name of the event itself. So if you're only interested in your HTTP request or you're only interested in GC, a specific GC event, for example, then you can filter based on that. Uh, but the other thing that I also mentioned is that you can't filter on duration. Uh, and what we have found is that the combination of these two is very, very powerful. In most cases, uh, you only really are interested uh, in events that take some, some time. You know, it depends a bit on the type of event. Uh, but in most cases, it's like you know, milliseconds uh, uh, worth of duration. That's where the threshold sort of is. Uh, and by using these two together, uh, you can, um, you can uh, accomplish very sophisticated and, and good filtering and again, keep the data you record down quite a lot. Uh, so that's worth knowing as well. Uh, and then I mentioned that we are capturing events from many different levels. So this is all the way from, as you saw, the application. If you uh, produce your own events, uh, we'll feed that into the stream. We capture events from the Java runtime level inside of the library, so I.O. and things like that. Uh, we capture things from the JVM side, so uh, everything from garbage collection to class loading and locks and things like that, uh, and all the way down to the operating system and CPU. And what that means is that there's, uh, you can do very uh, powerful in-depth analysis of what's going on inside of the system. So you can start on the application level, so you may know, for example, now that the, uh, the HTTP request took a long time. Well, it sure would be interesting to know what the Java runtime and the JVM was doing at that same time. So uh, you can sort of start on the high level. And then as you find out that, you know, I want to go deeper and understand what, what maybe a GC happened in the background, you can get all of that in the same visualization layer. You have all of that data in the same exact event stream. Um, so uh, the fact that you have all of it in the same place is very powerful and uh, uh, can enable you to do this sophisticated analysis very easily. So uh, I've mentioned a couple of times already that uh, this is something that you can and uh, arguably should be doing in production. And I have a whole section dedicated to that fact as well. Uh, so you saw the, in the overview picture uh, uh, how this actually works sort of in the background. And the nice part about this uh, being, being part of the runtime and you know, having worked with the JVM for as long as we have is that we have the unfair advantage of already collecting a lot of this, of this data. Uh, so on the GC side, for example, most of the data that we're feeding into the JPR, JFR event stream is stuff that the, G, the GC already is uh, collecting and it's using it to optimize itself. Likewise, the JIT compiler collects a bunch of data and it's using that to drive which methods get optimized and so on. Uh, and so by piggybacking on all of that and just sort of extracting it, taking the data that is already there and feeding it into JFR, that makes the, the overhead of this extremely low. Uh, I also mentioned that the data is being generated into thread local buffers first and uh, all of these things together make it so that we can collect extremely fine grained information with extremely low overhead. It's a very powerful uh, way of, of capturing all this data. Uh, now, if that still hasn't uh, uh, convinced you, uh, it may be worth knowing that uh, JFAR is by default on in our Oracle Fusion applications 
so I'm a low-level JVM guy, but uh, I know that we have customer relationship management uh, stuff and ERP and whatever they're called. Uh, and they all run with JV4 enabled because, well, we want to make it easy to understand what's going on in those big applications. Uh, we're also seeing uh, several other large companies use JV4 extensively in their deployments. Uh, so these are like hundreds of thousands of instances of Java running their business application, uh, uh, business logic, and uh, JV4 is turned on in all of those instances as well. So. Um, Again, I, I've said this a few times, uh, and I'll iterate it one last time, I think, uh, that uh, this is very mature technology, and it's something that we have designed to be used in production. The goal of uh, the default settings for J4 is to make the performance overhead less than 1%, uh, and basically that means that you should not see it if it is enabled. It's very much like the flight recorder in an airplane. Uh, you can turn it on, you should turn it on, it's there, and in case you need the data, uh, it's there for you. But, Michael, uh, you showed slides in the say fancy words. Uh, in the end, you know, surely this can't be true. You, you showed me in the earlier example how you cluttered up my perfect business logic. So again, this is going back to the example we had earlier. Uh, you clutter up my business logic with all this code. And surely there's no way that that code can have zero overhead. Uh, I, I can see there are like four lines of or three lines of JFR stuff here, and my super important one line business logic there in the middle, it, it, it won't work out, right? So uh, let me take you through a journey on how JVM uh, optimizations and the JIT compiler works, uh, and then we can see if, uh, you know, if, we, if we feel better about it. Uh, so, um, the begin call here, as I mentioned, is taking a timestamp. Um, so I'll, I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. But let's start by looking at the commit method. What does that look like? So the first thing I'll say is that this is not actually what commit looks like. Um, for various interesting reasons, it is being uh, bytecode generated as part of the startup of the JDK. Um, but uh, if it was an actual method, it would look something like this. Uh, so the first thing we do is to check if the uh, event, uh, this specific event, is enabled. Uh, so if it isn't, there's an early out, and basically we just return, and nothing is actually being executed, sort of. Um, and in the next step, what we do is to check if the duration is larger than that threshold we were talking about. Um, so if uh, the, the event is too short or if it doesn't reach the threshold, uh, likewise, there's an early out uh, and not, no, very low cost is just a check. Uh, and finally, there are a bunch of other checks. And in the end, though, if it turns out that we should actually really write the data to the event stream, there's a call to that actually commit method here. It, it's, that method actually doesn't exist. But uh, you can think of it as the one that actually does the thread local writes in the background. And remember that I said that even that is really cheap. It's just striding stores in the end, and that is something that uh, is very fast and efficient on modern CPUs. The application effectively won't notice. So even in that case, everything is fast. But let's have a look at what it would, uh, what what the performance overhead would be if the event is disabled. So. The first thing, uh, as I mentioned, is uh, that the begin method here, it actually is taking a timestamp. Well, what the JVM does and the JIT compiler does is make use of a few secret weapons, uh, very powerful weapons. And one of them is called inlining. So the first thing it does is to look at what the begin method actually does. Uh, and instead of calling another method, it will simply inline the code. So in this case, it will set the start time of that event to now. And in the next step, you will do the same thing to the now call here. It turns out that the now call is uh, something we call a JVM intrinsic. It's something that the JVM knows really well how to optimize for. And in the end, this is basically reading a CPU register. Um, it's using on x64, it's using the uh, read timestamp counter instruction to do this. But basically, this is you know, a cycle or a few cycles at most. So it's very, very efficient. So likewise, uh, for commit, we use also the inlining trick. Uh, and I haven't inlined or added all the code from the commit method here, but I did inline the first check, so the event.isEnabled uh, call here. Uh, if we inline that, we'll notice that the event is actually not enabled. We'll get the false constant. And then we use the second secret trick we have in the JIT compiler, which is dev code elimination. So 
knowing that the if statement here is not actually going to be executed, we can simply remove all that code. Uh, and now in the next step, uh, we use a third secret weapon of ours, which is called scalarization. Uh, we notice that the event instance here is not actually being used by anything other than this thread in this exact stack frame. And if that's true, then we don't actually have to store the data on the Java heap. We can store it locally in, let's say, stack uh, positions or registers for this frame specifically. So instead of storing the start time in the event, we store it as a local variable here in this frame instead. Now we have an allocation of uh, a my event instance, which isn't being used. So dev code elimination will remove that. And then finally, more dev code elimination. Nobody's using the start time, so that also goes away. So that is effectively what the JIT compiler is doing in the background. Uh, and in the end, you can see here that what remains after the, after the JIT compiler has done its work is your business logic, much like you'd like to see it. So that's the case when the event is disabled. But even if it is enabled, uh, all of this stuff, all the optimizations still happen. Obviously, you'll end up with slightly more uh, instructions uh, to produce the actual JFR data. But uh, remember, again, that is reading a timestamp counter twice. Uh, it is uh, storing a bunch of stuff to thread local buffers. And the overhead of that is very, very, very small. Uh, so the overhead here is certainly extremely small if your business logic does anything at all. Okay, so that's the, uh, the still words uh, and code moving around. Let's see uh, some performance charts because everybody loves bar charts. So this is showing the logging cost, sort of the overhead or if you so will, um, cost of doing log logging using various different frameworks. Um, this is in nanoseconds per operation um, and lower is therefore better. So from the left, you can see J4 disabled. Uh, and as I showed you on the last few slides, uh, when J4 is disabled, all that code will be going away and the overhead will be zero. Uh, you're seeing J4 enabled with stack depth one. And I'll talk a bit more about why uh, I'm calling out stack depth one here. But uh, as you can see, the overhead is, it's there, it's higher, but it's still very, very small. Remember those are nanoseconds per operation. Uh, so it's roughly a microsecond or so. Uh, if you were using log4j, even in the off setting, there is an overhead. It's not significant, but it's there. Um, and if you actually start logging things, you see that the overhead goes up pretty significantly. So we're now up to, you know, getting close to milliseconds uh, of overhead. Um, if you use Java util logging, you have a, a similar sort of overhead in the off case. Uh, and now the Interesting question here. Anybody dare guess what the last two bars will look like? Um, I'm not going to wait for, for answers, but uh, do your best speculation and reveal. Uh, it didn't fit into the earlier slide, so I had to modify the, um, uh, the y-axis um, values here, uh, the range. It is very, very significant. As you say, to see everything else sort of, you know, disappears in comparison. So the overhead there is extremely high. Uh, and this is sort of what you'll typically see with JFR. It's extremely uh, low overhead, extremely efficient, and therefore, again, um, don't hesitate to use it in production. But I did mention uh, stack uh, depth uh, and stack uh, traces. Uh, by, this, by design, again, Flight Recorder has been designed to have less than 1% overhead in the common or default configuration. I should start by saying that there are other configurations that can have more overhead. Um, so the default configuration we've tuned and ensured sort of that it stays under that 1% overhead uh, threshold. Uh, but if you start enabling events, uh, especially allocation events, or let's say you add events to innermost loops in your application, then uh, obviously that can have higher overhead. Um, and one of the things that is sort of worth keeping in mind is that stack depth and the stack traces, and especially deep stacks, is still sort of an issue for us. Uh, walking the stack is relatively uh, expensive. Uh, and therefore, if you capture, if you have very deep thread stacks and you capture uh, data in, again, hot loops, a lot of events uh, with deep stacks, then you will see performance impact. Uh, now, this is something that we are working on optimizing and improving on, but it's worth keeping in mind that that can have an effect. But again, in the default case, the, the whole design is less than 1% uh, in production or 
So how can you use JD, J4? Um, so here are a few examples of command lines uh, that you can try out. Uh, this is focusing on the JDK 11 and later use case. Uh, the command lines uh, are slightly different for, for the earlier versions, uh, but uh, I recommend that you sort of start playing around with JDK 11 and later if you use this. Uh, the first uh, example here is just turning on flight recordings. Um, so it's we will start recording in the background, uh, and you can run you know whatever application you have. That will collect all the data and store it in that repository in the background. But if you want to extract it, uh, you can do that in two different ways. Uh, one is by specifying on the command line uh, as an argument to or a sub option to the start flight recording option. You can specify the uh, the file name that the data should be put into or produced into. And I'll show you this in a minute as well. Uh, so that is if you uh, remember to add the option before you start up your application. In case it's already running and you want to start the recording and get the information out, you, you can do that as well. Uh, there is uh, in your JDK, in the bin directory, there's a command called jcmd. Uh, it's short for J command, uh, and you can use that to both start recordings, that's the third example here, uh, and for that sake, dump out the, uh, the data to a file as well, uh, and that's the second option here. Uh, so let's have a look at what that actually looks like in, uh, uh, in practice. Uh, so I'm going to do pretty much exactly what I showed you on the slide. Uh, so I'm going to say uh, run again. We're going to reuse the J, uh, Java 2D demo, uh, and I'm going. I'm saying start a flight recording and put the data in a file called temp j2d.jfr. Uh, and just to prove that um, I'm not cheating, uh, you can see that there is no such file yet. So if we run this. We'll hopefully see that uh, J2D demo starts up. Uh, and we can see here that uh, the flight recording has started in the background. So uh, we take our favorite Java 2D demo. I like to click on this guy because it's very psychedelic. Like it's one of those, like you're feeling drowsy, you'll be sleeping in a minute, that, that sort of thing. But okay, um, so we've uh, run that for a while. It's been collecting some data in the background. And if we exit now and we go look at temp, you can see that we now have a j2d.jfr file. Um, since of JDK 11, uh, there's a handy tool called jfr in your bin directory. So if I list, let me actually do this. Uh, if I list uh, the contents of my Java home, I'll see that there's a jfr command. And if you run that, it will tell you uh, a bit of how you can record information. So that's what I just did. And it also tells you a bit about how you can actually observe or visualize, print out the data that you just collected. So let's do exactly that. So we'll run JFR, we'll say print, and we'll give it the flight recording file you just collected. And this will now produce a lot of output because it's listing all the events that were captured during the run of that 2D demo for however many seconds we did that. So obviously you can see a lot of things uh, you know, being printed out on screen here. Uh, what you also can see is that uh, there, this is sort of human readable. Uh, you can see that we have uh, various interesting events happening. They have start times. They contain some event-specific data and so on. There are other uh, ways of printing out the data. So if you specify, for example, dash dash JSON, you will get it, no surprise, in JSON format because that's what the cool kids are using nowadays. Uh, so this is the exact same information, but now uh, encoded as JSON, which makes it maybe easier to uh, uh, consume in other tools, things like that. Uh, you can also uh, ask J4 to print out the summary of what's in the file. So uh, in this case, we're seeing that it is using version 2.1 of the file format. Uh, it, the recording started at a certain time and so on. And we see sort of a histogram of the events that were produced, so how many the size and bytes of those events. Uh, just sort of uh, a handy way of showing what is in this recording. There are other things you can do with the J4 command, but um, suffice to say that this is sort of one way of visualizing data. There are many other ways as well, uh, and I'll show you in a uh, few minutes uh, another example of what that could look like. Go back to this. 
Um, went through that. Uh, use cases, we did talk about production um, and hopefully you, you, uh, you are now agreeing that this can and should be used in production. Uh, development is sort of the obvious other candidate for this. Um, finding hot methods, uh, optimizing your application. One of the interesting use cases we found was as part of testing. Uh, so as part of testing actually J4 itself, uh, we can get very detailed information about the execution patterns and so on of what's going on in the, uh, the application. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Some future work. Um, realize that I'm running a bit late here. I'm hoping that it's okay that I use a few additional minutes. Um, so uh, some of the future is here. As a matter of fact, when I did uh, a version of this presentation earlier, JDK 14 had not been released yet, but uh, since of last week it has. And that means that uh, some of the stuff uh, that I'll be talking about here is actually available now in JDK 14. Uh, this is what it looked like sort of to uh, produce and consume J4 data in the past. Uh, so basically, uh, earlier you had to first start the recording, you had to wait for the recording to capture all the events, and then at some point you had to stop it and get the data out of that uh, repository to the separate file that you then could observe. That's not very user-friendly if you want to do it continuously, and so what we've done with something called event streaming is that we made it possible to get the data out on a continuous basis. So that's the, the, the thing I talked about where we dump out the data roughly every second or so and make it possible to observe it continuously. Um, event streaming has a JEP associated with it. I have a few uh, links uh, on, a, on the last uh, slide in this deck uh, that you can have a look at, but basically uh, the goal of the whole feature is to make it trivial to consume and act on events continuously. Uh, and the way we do that is by uh, providing an API uh, that can be used to get the data from that disk rep repository and uh, process and act on the events in various ways. And as I said, this is now available in JDK 14, uh, which was released last week. What it looks like on a high level is something like this. Um, we were hoping to get it down to a one-liner, and it's not a one-liner, but it's not too far off. Uh, so basically, there's a way of opening up the recording stream. Um, this is taking data from that repository I talked about. Uh, you can uh, say that I want to enable, I want to look at Java monitor entry events. So this is uh, Java locking related, for example. And I only want to look at events that take 10 milliseconds or more. And if I see one of those events, I want to print out the, the type that was synchronized on. Um, not going to go into the details about how uh, the, that get class call uh, method works here, but in either case, I'll print out uh, what the monitor actually was, or the synchronization, the synchronization, the type it was synchronizing on. Uh, and then I call start, and that will basically then uh, have this thread, the caller of this thread, uh, process the events until the stream is uh, closed or it, until it ends. There are asynchronous ways of doing this as well uh, if you want to try that. Likewise, if I want to also look for CPU load events, I can do that. So let's have a quick look, try to go through this quickly, even though I know that it's, uh, it can be sort of a mouthful. Um, am I allowed uh, five more minutes? Keep going, Michael. Great, thank you. Um, so let's see if I can go into appearance presentation mode. Um, hopefully you can see this. Uh, so this is a Spring Boot uh, application. And being the JVM guy I am, I know almost literally nothing about Spring Boot. Um, but basically some uh, helpful colleague of mine, Eric Aldin uh, and Marcus Grundlund, J4 guys, uh, helped me uh, prepare this demo. And basically what it does is that it does um, intercept HTTP requests in the Spring Boot application. Uh, and long story short, uh, for every HTTP request, we generate a JFR event. And specifically what we do here is we uh, generate the event and we also capture the URI for that event. So we, we as part of the starting the, uh, the request, we create the event and we call begin, so we capture the timestamp. And as part of completing the event, we capture the URI and we call end to get the timestamp, and then we feed the event data into that event stream. 
Um, so let's see. Mm. Okay, and uh, I've also prepared a couple of, um, we have prepared a couple of endpoints. So the first one um, looks like this. So there's a hello world, uh, hello endpoint. And the only thing it does is to print out the message. Uh, but there are a few other endpoints as well. One is called hello one. And what that will show you is something that is sort of CPU intensive. It's going to do something that will take some time to process. And we'll be making use of that. So remember that hello one is CPU intensive. Hello2 is GC intensive, so it stresses the garbage collector in some way. So Hello2 does GC. And Hello3 does something with lock contention. And these are, these are just sort of ways of showing the, the capabilities of what JFR is capturing and producing. Um, so that's our application in a nutshell. Uh, if I start that up in the background, and I'll do that by much like you've seen now a few times, I'll uh, use the start flight recording um, command line option and I'll run my Spring Boot application. So I'll do that here in the background. Uh, I have another small application um, which is called monitor.java. Uh, and this is a small agent that will consume data from the J uh, J4 repository and analyze it and act on it. And specifically what we'll do uh, is to look for those HTTP requests that I talked about. Uh, let's see if we can find it here. So much like the code you saw on the slides, uh, slide earlier, uh, we'll open up the repository, we'll wait for HTTP requests, and then if we get a re HTTP request that has a duration longer than 500 milliseconds, we'll do some analysis on it. Uh, and the cool part about this is uh, that you now have a stream that is only looking for each, this HTTP request. So this is sort of starting from the top, if you think about it that way. We're starting with, with the application level and we're waiting for those events to happen. And most of them probably take less than 500 milliseconds. So that's fine. But in the cases they do take longer, we obviously want to know more. And then we can call this analyze method. Um, and basically what that does is to go back in time. So now we're opening up a separate stream. We're taking data that has been already stored in that repository and we're saying, start a bit earlier, set the start date, uh, start time to a second ago, because we want to look at other things that were going on at the time and what led up to this problem we have now. So we're saying start a second earlier and a second later just to get a good range here and look for a few other events. So now we're going into the sort of the next level here. We're looking for GC related stuff, we're looking for Java monitor or lock related stuff, and we're looking for CPU related stuff. And you can, uh, uh, you know, imagine what these uh, do in the end, right? But they're, they're looking for these sort of patterns that we are interested in. So I'm going to run that agent now, uh, and I'm going to do this, uh, do it like this. Um, for the keen eye here, you can see that I'm running Java on a Java file. That's also relatively new functionality. If you have a single class with a main method in it, you don't have to Java C it first, you can just run it. Um, and I'm now running that agent. This is now running in a separate process. I pointed it at, or it's finding out on its own which processes are running. And you can see, well, and you can see that I'm still running Java 2D demo, but it also found my Spring Boot application. And it has now started actively monitoring those instances for the, the events that I was uh, waiting for, the HTTP requests specifically. Uh, so if I run, uh, if I access the hello rest endpoint here, you can see that, well, we did get an HTTP request and it was fairly fast to process. If I process or call hello one, remember hello one is CPU intensive. So you can see that it took a while to get the response and also the monitoring agent here found that there was an execution sample. Uh, something took a long time to execute. And we can get nicely here packaged uh, the stack trace. So you can see that the CPU intensive method was called. Uh, and this can helpfully sort of, uh, hopefully sort of helpfully uh, uh, make us understand that this method, there's something happening in it that probably shouldn't uh, happen. Hello2 is GC intensive. So after a while here, we should hopefully get some information about uh, the GC intensive stuff that is happening. We have some kind of phase uh, inside of the GC that took a long time. And then finally, 
hello three here is synchronization uh, intensive in some way. It's doing something with uh, object synchronization. And, and likewise, you can see the stack trace. You can also see that we're locking on an object. So if I would go back to the code I showed you earlier in my Spring Boot app, you'd see that the instance that I allocate and synchronize on is an object. Um, so that was that demo. And then just to sort of wrap this up, hopefully you, you can get a sense of how sort of powerful this is, that you can, again, go back in time and look at what led up to a certain event. Uh, and all of this, again, without uh, any significant overhead. There's a lot of cool futures uh, work in this area. Um, I like to think that with the event streaming stuff that I just demoed, uh, we have the first sort of real version of JFR, a uh, complete set of features, if you so will. Uh, but obviously, we can take this to the next level, and we're constantly looking at how we can improve on things, add more events, uh, simplify the use of JFR, both from command line and the APIs. Uh, we're looking at uh, uh, in Open Dedicate, there's a, a project called Loom, which is looking at adding fibers or virtual threads uh, to the Java platform. So it's revamping pretty much how threads work. Uh, and we want to make sure that JFR fits very nicely into that as well. So lots of cool stuff happening there. Uh, we are seeing a lot of integration opportunities. So with JFR in the platform, you have a very far powerful framework and basis for building additional stuff on top of it. So uh, we already are seeing some IDEs pick up and, and leverage this, IntelliJ uh, and Visual VM and others. Uh, monitoring frameworks, APM stuff. New Relic had a blog post just the other day um, talking a bit about how they are looking at JFR. Uh, and other frameworks uh, we're looking into fitting into in one way or another um, at the bottom there. Uh, Please help us. Um, JDK 14 uh, is since of last week GA, so you can find binaries available on that first URL. Uh, JDK 15, if you want to try out, be on the sort of bleeding edge, uh, we are publishing early access binaries um, on that second URL. And if you have feedback, and please do uh, take this for a spin, let us know what you find. Uh, you can send in, uh, data or information to uh, that mailing list there. Summary, um, J4 is JDK flight recorder. It's probably there in the JDK um, you have right now. Uh, it's event-based, built into the Java runtime, and that means that it has, we have the unfair advantage of making it extremely low overhead, and it's meant for production. Uh, allows the correlation, as I showed, all the way from the application down to the operating system. Uh, and there are APIs both for producing and consuming APIs. I have a few links uh, to additional reading here, and I'll leave this slide up, uh, hoping that we have at least a couple of minutes for questions as well. So, Michael, thank you very much. This is uh, amazing. It's uh, so much in depth. Uh, I think my processor in my head is going to take a long time to finish processing what I've seen here. So thank you so much. Uh, I want to spend just a few minutes, if you don't mind, uh, for you to answer some questions that were posted. Uh, I'll read them off to you. Uh, the first one I see here is, uh, uh, and you probably have answered this already, but uh, what's the point of having an at enable annotation false event since it won't be logged? So you can enable event. So there's a default configuration per event, uh, but then at runtime or startup time or whatever you want to call it, you can override the defaults. So let's say that you have some uh, event that you're mostly not interested in. It's like for debugging purposes or, or whatever. Uh, it, it's there just in case you need it. Uh, so then you could easily imagine that the, uh, the default setting is that it's not enabled. But then when you run, you know, either you have some special one-off run you want to do or you're using this in development or for some reason, this event now suddenly is actually of interest to you, then you can on the command line or again using a, there are ways of, of specifying profiles, uh, the, the, the set of or the configuration for events to use when the JVM process starts up. So there you can override the default settings. Hopefully okay. that makes sense. The, the next question is, uh, is the JFR overhead for other platforms similar to x86? Yes. So we, our whole per goal and a lot of the, uh, the optimizations and, and the, the implementation that we have is actually very platform independent. So when it comes down to it, among, among the only things that is platform dependent is how exactly we grab the timestamp 
Uh, and that there are uh, efficient ways of doing that for pretty much all the different CPUs. It, it, it may vary in you know, exactly how many nanoseconds it takes, uh, but we're, we're spending a lot of time making sure that that works well. Okay, there are two more questions. Uh, is the streaming health agent source available anywhere? I, so I, uh, I will dig that up and I'll, I'll tweet it out uh, later uh, if and when I have a link to it. it. We should make it available in some way. Very good. And uh, is there a performance comparison chart for, sorry, with different stack trace values? Uh, so I don't have uh, any uh, sh charts to show you now. Now, when I say that stack traces are expensive, don't let that scare you all too much. Uh, we, you know, when I, so what we've seen, what I've seen over the years working on Java is that applications are different. Uh, many applications are, I'm going to call them well-behaved. They have tens of stack frames or so, in which case the overhead is still very, very small. Um, when it's starting to hurt is when you have thousands of threads and all the threads have very, very deep stack traces. Uh, in that case, we're, we're starting to add up uh, the cost of walking the stacks. It's still relatively cheap if i put it that way uh, so don't let it scare you all too much it's also something that we're looking at optimizing taking into account the fact that most threads since last time we took the stack trace will not have actually changed what they're doing it's still the same stack trace uh, so we're looking at ways of optimizing that as well uh, but i don't have any charts to show you right now um if i don't if you don't mind i want to sneak in one question for myself um i've had several people ask me this so i think it's probably relevant um, this is an amazing feature-rich uh, tool. It's open source. Is there a particular JDK that we should be using? Oracle JDK, Open JDK, any particular JDK that we are required to use? So JFR has been, as I mentioned in the sort of history slides, JFR has been around for a very long time. Now, uh, with JDK 11, when JFR was open sourced, it's basically part of all the Open JDK-based JDKs if that uh, it makes sense. Um, before that, it was only part of the Oracle JDK. Uh, and be, well, even before that, it was another JDK altogether. But let's say, uh, so it, the availability does vary a bit, but I'm going to say that most of the JDKs out there have it in one shape, way, shape, or form. Uh, so the, um, the decision of which JDK to use is, uh, you know, there are considerations. Obviously, J4 needs to be in the JDK you're looking for, looking at uh, using, but uh, most of the decision there is uh, orthogonal to the availability of J4, if that helps. Very good. Well, thank you so much again. I really appreciate it. I want to turn it over to Sharat. Yeah, Michael, thank you again. Folks, we're going to just take a short little break here. We'll start again at 11.45. Uh, and we'll set up for the next speaker. So if you need to take a personal break, now's the time and we'll be back in just a few minutes. Michael, thank you so much.